when there is a priesthood in your family, say your great 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 grandfather was a was a herbalist, was a witch doctor, there is something of God's calling on that bloodline that the enemy has hijacked. And God's calling still remains on that bloodline until a deliverer arises in that bloodline. You may just be the deliverer for your bloodline. The devil messed with the wrong person. I've noticed in my life, and I found that nothing really happens until I've accumulated a lot of prayer behind it. So your being here is a result of prayer. And it's not really that we thought the prayer was going to be answered this way. But back in August, the Lord, uh, actually back in July, I went on a three-day retreat. And I, the Lord spoke to me and just uh, gave me these words. And I said it to my team. And it was this. He said, build priesthood and see what I do. So I said to the team, Here's what we're going to do in August. August is normally our quiet month because people go on holiday and summer and all that. So a lot of the staff are away. I said, I know, I know a lot of you guys already booked your holidays, but I really feel the Lord calling us to do this. So if you're able to do it, join us. We didn't announce it, and we didn't, we didn't even publicize it. It was by invite only. And so what we did was nine days of prayer for nine hours every day. And there was no preaching there was no teaching. We just sat in the room and just went after God. There was no agenda. We're going to pray into this. In fact, there was a time we tried. It just was like, no, that's not the agenda of heaven. We need to just get back onto heaven's agenda. And at times it was challenging in the flesh. And at times it was the most glorious. <laughs> and some people in this room were in that space. It was, it, it was in, an incredible time. We had no idea that that was an accumulation of prayer that was building up. And here you are from 30 plus nations coming together here. I, are you hearing me? Nothing just happens. We didn't know our prayer. God was using that to mobilize things in the spirit. Because this is the time for this movement. It's a time. It's not that it's not been the time before. But we're entering into a new phase of the calling the Lord has placed on us. And it's a very simple calling, but it's one that means a lot to the Lord. And I want you to understand that I am not leading this ministry out of ambition. I'm not leading this ministry because I, you know, I'm looking for a platform and I want to find somewhere to preach. I often say to people, I'm not itching to preach. I know when I preach, I can move men and women, but when I pray, I can move angels and demons. I'm not itching to preach. I'm itching to pray. And I'm itching to connect with people that want to pray. Not just talk about prayer, but do it. And I am convinced that some of the people that are walking the closest with God on the planet are probably not the preachers. And I don't care if they cannot preach. I want to spend time with such people that know how to navigate the realm of God. I want to... I wanna, have friendships with people that know his realm in a deep way and can show me things I don't know and can challenge me. A lot of people are falling in love with platforms and falling in love with followers and falling in love with whatever. But here at this ministry of Preston, our core desire is we're after God. I want you to hear me. That is our goal. And so, even when we preach, we're not pointing you to ourselves. As I'm going to preach in a moment, we want you to go to God. Because some preachers have a dysfunction in them that likes the fact that everyone is coming to them for them to lay hands on them. And so they propagate a dysfunction in the body of Christ because they don't train the people to find God for themselves. And the people don't want to find God for themselves. They say, Moses, you climb up the mountain and then you come back and tell us what God has said. They don't want to climb up. But here we are training everyone to climb up. We want to climb up. 
And so we don't want to raise a bunch of people that just want to get fed and you want to feel good in the moment, but don't, don't really grow in spiritual stamina and significance in the spirit. This is something I say often. The 21st century church has become a nursery where babies are being fed and not a barracks where warriors are being bred. We want to raise up warriors, which means each of us has to be strong because we cannot be an army if you are not a soldier. If you don't know how to use your weapons of war and you're still struggling to cast out the devil from your house and you don't understand the way of the altar, you don't understand the rules of spiritual engagement and we call ourselves an army, we're a joke. Because the enemy is trained, he's been in this for de centuries. He studies us, as you heard earlier in one of the sessions. He knows the specific weapons to release against us. So how can we not be trained? So I want to announce to you, gone are the days of superstars. God is wanting to raise up every saint in the church. It's the day of the saints. It's not, oh James, you're the man of God, lay hands on me, lay legs on me, get me free. No, 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 you lay hands on yourself. Yeah. Now, I am not saying it's wrong to ask for someone to pray for you, but the times when you grow in God, you realize you, need, you now need to, how many of you ever just lay hands on yourself? You can go through self-deliverance. You and the Holy, in fact, someone messaged me the other day on, uh, on Instagram. They are reading my book. I'm not doing this to promote my book, by the way, but I'm, I, it's just what came to mind right now. They are reading my book and they felt the Holy Spirit say, read that line again. And they read that line again. They said, read that line again. And as they read it, a demon manifested and they got delivered. <laughs> From reading a, a section that the Holy Spirit, what I'm trying to say is, I'm, I'm, I thank God for the apostles, the prophets, the teachers. But with all that's going on in the body of Christ right now, I know lots of people are disillusioned and many people are hurt and disappointed. And we're still going to honor leaders because I believe they're still leaders of integrity that God is raising up. Not everyone is living in immorality in a double lifestyle. Not everyone is unaccountable. There are many true leaders. Many of them are not famous. Many of them are not known. So we're going to honor righteous and godly leadership. But at the same time, we want to raise up an army such that the least of, among us is as strong as David. Yeah. So what's happening right here is something that God orchestrated. And everyone on my team, we're like blown away that you would all come. Many of you never heard of this ministry before. You just saw a video and you got stirred and now here you are. And now you can't unhear what you've heard. And now God is marking you. Many of you watching online, you've just seen the thing. Oh, who are these guys? Oh, you know. Yeah. God has drawn you to this moment. Um, in carrying on that same theme, I want you to understand that there are lots of things that many of you come to us for prayer for. And it's not that we don't want to pray for you, but we want to impart understanding so that you know the way to see yourself come out. Because it, it's one thing for someone to lay hands on you and boom, but it's another thing when you understand the ways of God enough, not just to see yourself come out, but now to be used to set other people free because you understand the principles of the kingdom and you understand what I call spiritual intelligence. One of the problems we have in the Western church is uh, we're, we're spiritually uneducated. Like, we're, we can be theologically sound, but spiritually inept. Yeah. Yeah. We can understand things theologically and intellectually, but we don't understand how to read the signs and understand the spirit realm and understand the boundaries, even in the way God works with us. Tomorrow morning, I'm hoping we can do a Q&A, just because of the number of questions I've had. And I've said some of them, if I start answering your question right now, I know I could go on and on, and I feel like it will be a blessing to lots of people. So it might be best to, to just do a session where you can ask questions. Um, 
I've never gone into the word, but this was coming to me because you guys didn't give me time to rest this afternoon. So it's just me and the Holy Ghost going to flow right now. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Rules of engagement. I was praying for a lady earlier today. And, uh, you know, uh, she shared something really heartbreaking. You know, um, after she saw the testimony, she started to pray in a very intense way. And uh, she and her friend went somewhere. Um, and they just had to pray. And their prayers started to go into some realms where they were uh, taking authority and rebuking things over territories and regions. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it was due with knife crime. I don't know what the wording of the prayers were, but in the way I felt it, because when she told me what the problem was, I was like, where did, where did you go? She told me where she went. I said, what were you praying? She said, well, we're just praying for move God. No, I said, what exactly were you praying into? Then I said, were you praying like this? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I now try to explain to her why. It's not that it's wrong to pray that way, but you need to understand the rules of engagement. So, they went somewhere with the zeal for the Lord and wanting to see God move. They were praying over like, you know, Lord, you're just casting down this, I, I don't know, you know, you're binding all the spirits that are causing this issue in this region and at standing against this, this spirit that's functioning in this territory and Lord, that's for breakthrough. And doing that consistently, day in, day out. I don't know for how long. I can't remember the story exactly. And my, you know, my heart was broken because when I was speaking to her, I, you know, she just started weeping and I could feel that there was zeal, but there was just not an understanding of how to pray effectively. It's not that it's wrong to pray that, but there's a way to do that. And the way she went about that was not the right way because once she was in isolation. You can't be trying to take on an army as a lone ranger. The kingdom of darkness is very organized. You can't just wake up, okay, right now I'm going to go to the Netherlands and bind all the spirits that's functioning, you know, in the, I don't know what that area is where all the prostitutions are. I bind all this, I, I come against this, and Lord, I ask for you, and you keep doing that. <laughs> it's not that you, you can't do that as a believer, but you're putting yourself in danger if you just went there and no one said, and God didn't send you there. So you say to me, oh James, there's a witch coffin down the road and they're doing this, 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 this. Like great. I mean, it's not great, but we're gonna do what we do. You do you, we do us. And let's see what altar wins. Now, I'm not going to go there and start, I'm going into the, you know, into the whatever, to altars and start pulling stuff down and start, because God has not sent me there. If I receive an instruction to go there, then I'm going to go. But if he's not sending me, I'm going to keep praying right here. So the mistake she made in my uh, observation was a lack of a community to take on that sort of thing and not under covering. And I know sometimes this can be abused because people are like, oh, you know, I don't, what do you mean by covering? Spiritual father, this. Um, my goal is not to go into the detail on that. It's just to explain a spiritual principle. I wouldn't engage in any kind of warfare like that unless it's instigated by the Lord. Unless I am part of a community of people and I know God has given us an anointing, an assignment to war in that way. When I pray on my own at home, I am not coming against all the powers of darkness in the United Kingdom. I don't, I'm not doing that. Now, a healthy way to pray for the United Kingdom is to cry out for the mercy of God and to cry out for a move of God. Are you hearing me? But when it comes to coming against stuff and I'm pulling this down and I'm doing this, you got to first watch what army am I a part of right now? Who's covering my back? In the natural, you don't see a lone ranger soldier trying to just take on a whole army. And even if you see that, he often has a backup. People watching his back. He's running to take something out and you have all these other soldiers who are maybe snipers taking everyone. Are you with me? So even on my team, I say to my team, you need to have prayer cover. 
I mean, let, I mean, this is a spiritual ministry. Many people even come and serve in the band and their life goes crazy. I mean, you won't believe the stories. The moment they say, okay, yes, I want to volunteer, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> This happens, the child six, this one faints, they're on the way here, the mad person attacks them over here, this happens. James, you won't believe what happened to me today. Well, you said yes to serve a prayer storm, right? <laughs> because you said yes, you're, you're, you're stepping into a war zone that we're in. Now, I am in it, but I am not feeling all the things you're saying. Because I'm functioning within my jurisdiction of authority. I'm not taking on what the Lord is not calling me to take on. Are you hearing me? My purpose in sharing this is not to instigate fear because I do believe we have authority. And if in this meeting, as we start praying, I'm like, okay, right now, we're going to stand against all the altars of wickedness in Manchester. That, by the way, there are times we've done that, not in meetings like these. I, I, I would see this as a different type of meeting because for those sort of things to do, for us to do those sort of things, I would like to have elders and leaders in the territory that I am in covenant relationship with and understand what we're doing and we're on the same heart together. Then we can, if the Lord is leading us, start to come against the altars in the territory. But you can't be coming against the altars if yours is not strong. Because those altars you're coming against, they've been there for Hundreds of years, some of them. And you think you're just going to say, I come against you in Jesus' name, and it's going to be done? You're joking. When was the last boxing, I mean, boxing, you, you, I, there was a recent big match that happened, I think. It's not often just you start the match and one blow and it's over. I mean, it's rare that happens. It, you know, you get punched and you punch. <laughs> the fact that you, you hit a blow does not mean it's over, Right? The, the opponent also tries to look for an opportunity to strike. So there is a constant tussling back and forth. So you've got to understand that the enemy looks for every avenue to strike back. That's why you cannot afford to be a lone ranger. And this was not meant to be my message today. I don't know how I ended up here. So accountability, community, coming under authority is so key. Someone came to me and said, you know, I feel frustrated at my church and blah, blah. I said, who sent you to that church? Can you ask, the, can you just trace your steps back? How did you get there? If you can tell me the Lord led you there, then you stay there until it tells you to leave. You don't leave because you got offended. You don't leave because the pastor preached something you didn't like. And you don't leave because you say, I'm not being fed. Now, I've got a one and a half year old and she gets mad when I try to feed her. She can feed herself. So my question to you is, what do you mean you're not being fed? Have you lost your Bible? What do you mean you're not being fed? Have you lost your prayer life? What do you mean you're not being fed? Have you lost your worship life? Because... You don't just go to church to get a word from God. You go to church to get a confirmation of the word you were getting when you were at home. Now, I'm not saying you don't get fed in church. I do, I do understand that. But my, the point I'm trying to make is people just church hop based on how they feel. God did not lead them. The same way they just take on things based on zeal without wisdom. We can't be doing what we're doing called prayer storm and not be spiritually intelligent. Many people are spiritually unintelligent. You know when someone has a low IQ in the natural? Many people have a low IQ in the spirit, so to speak. They're, they're, they're spiritually, they're, like, can you not see the signs? Can you not see the patterns? Can you not just look and say, something is wrong here? And I need to wake up. But you don't want to do the work. You want a man of God that's so God to come and just do a magic for you. Prayer is not magic. I hope you've realized that. God wants to build you. He wants to make you. And he wants to raise up warriors who are righteous and seeking him consistently. And 
sometimes what we receive from platforms, depending on the purity of the platform and, you know, the insecurities can be raising up a bunch of people that are just always dependent on the word from the platform as opposed to learning to be dependent on a hearing ear that they've developed in the secret place. When was the last time you took a retreat just to seek God by yourself? Oh, I'm, this issue has been going on for a long time. And I'm just, well, let's put the issue aside. You and God, where are you? Have you taken three days out just to seek God? No food? Have you taken seven days out just to seek God? You know, Moses, he was in the mountaintop. I think it was for six or seven days, six days. Stay there and God didn't speak. And then on the seventh day, God said, something. God called to Moses. So seven days Moses sat in silence. Have you sat before the presence of God in silence for six days? Nothing. Just sit there and just, Lord, I'm waiting. We like the power that Moses walked in. We like the glory dimension he walked in, but we don't want to emulate the lifestyle that led to that sort of glory. I call it, it, it's a delusion, delusional hypocrisy. We like what they have, but we don't want to do what they did to get to where they are. We just want the quick fix. And what I'm here to say to you is, in the kingdom of God, there are no quick fixes. There are miraculous things that God does and he will do that and he's done that for many of you already and he's going to keep doing that. However, when God wants to raise the people, he doesn't do it. It takes, a, it takes a while for God to raise a real, sincere, genuine man or woman of God. It doesn't happen overnight. And it's good you condition yourself to understand God likes to take his time. You're in a hurry. He's not. And if you don't submit to his process, you would end up running from one conference to another and eventually, because you're in a hurry, you end up putting your head under the hand of someone that submitted to a demonic altar. Wow. All in search of your breakthrough. Your breakthrough has now become your idol, not God. Because when you start to seek God, even in your frustration, seek him. Even in your whatever, the bitterness, the disappointment, seek Him. See, I've said to people, I have no other option. I'm not doing prayer storm because I'm after a platform. If this platform goes, in fact, you know what that means? As in this ministry, it gives me more time to pray. Yeah. Because now I don't have to organize a conference. And the amount of work that goes into this, it's great. And I thank God for the grace to do this. But my goal is not to be doing stuff like this all the time. I'm not after this thing. Oh, let's just build crowd. Let's just get people coming. And that's not what we're after. We are seeking God. And what I want to say to you is let God be your ultimate aim. Yeah. Ultimate focus. So let me finish the thing with the lady that I was talking to earlier. Because I went off on some rabbit trail. <laughs> so um, she was telling me about some not so great things that happened right after they finished the prayer. I think her husband had a stroke and then the other, uh, her other friend, something terrible happened to that friend's husband. She was just saying she was just grieved. So I said, I think what you did, you did it out of zeal and you just trespassed in the jurisdiction of authority God's given you. Those are prayers, they're not wrong, but you were not covered. You were not in community when you did that. And I think that was an open door for the enemy to strike in this way. I said, I believe God's going to restore. And I, I know she's hearing me right now. I believe God's going to restore your husband. And he's going to restore your friend's husband. Yeah. However, you need to start by acknowledging that trespass. Say, Lord, have mercy. I was, I was zealous and I just, I just did that. But I also try to explain to her, it's not that it's wrong to bind the enemy and come against the enemy. Especially when it's within your household. Are you hearing me? If it's your household, your husband, your children, your bloodline, you can come against and stand against 
whatever you want to stand. Are you hearing me? Because it's within your jurisdiction. If it's your children and you're a parent, you have more authority to pray over them than even my voice because you gave birth to them. You carry them for nine months. There is an authority. If you bless them, it's powerful. If you curse them, it's also powerful. Because you're the parent. Even if they're not talking to you anymore, your authority still stands. Even if your parents are not Christians, they still have authority. So you still honor them even if you don't agree with them. Because you don't want to come into a place where you are receiving curses, that you instigate curses from them. Because it carries weight coming from an authority. And if an authority does that to you, has done that to you, you need another authority to reverse it. Oftentimes, when relationships have gone sour and you've been hurt in a certain way, for God to heal you, one of the ways He does it, He presents you another relationship that helps you heal the perversion of the previous one. So the, the, these things you start to understand, it's important who you connect yourself with. Please listen. Don't be a lone ranger. Don't be isolated. And don't be hopping around from place to place, from church to church. Because you want your breakthrough, make sure first and foremost, you are seeking the Lord. I know you want your breakthrough, but how much time have you spent just being with Him? Not that He doesn't want to hear about your need and your problems. Some people are obsessed with their problems. Obsessed. This is all they talk about. It's all they think about. It's just there all the time. It's not that God doesn't want to heal you or bring breakthrough, but that obsession needs to be shifted. The right perspective is to be obsessed with God. Because as you know, many Christians, they seek God for what He can do. They seek his hands and then once the blessing comes, the blessing becomes the very thing that distracts them from him. My time is gone, but we're still going to read scripture to make this meeting legal. <laughs> I believe in reading scripture, not just rambling. Everything I'm saying is scriptural, but we don't have time to break it all down. Genesis 28.10. We're going to talk about altars, and we may talk, uh, uh, talk on covenants. Because a lot of the things some of you are dealing with, if you just understand how altars work, and understand how covenants work, and be able to spiritually read where you are at, then you'll start to understand what you need to do. You start to understand the sort of lifestyle you need to step into to undo some things. You know, there's sometimes where God brings deliverance to you and you're not seeking deliverance. By virtue of the height you've gone in the spirit, deliverance just manifests. Like the eagle. The height, it's flying out. Some things cannot bear that height. So you're fighting some things on the ground, but you've not learned to ascend. Because when you ascend, those things you're fighting on the ground, they cannot survive up there. Your problem is you, you've been in the terrain and the territory for too long. So I do believe in the active role of seeking deliverance and freedom, but I also believe there's some things that fall off of you without you even seeking it because you're ascending and your lifestyle has completely changed. Some of you, what is feeding that cycle is your lifestyle. And your lifestyle hasn't changed, but you want the demon gone. So the demons and all this stuff is broken, is gone, but because your lifestyle hasn't changed, you end up back in that place. Or you might have a bit of relief for a few moments and you end up in that cycle. Can I announce to you that freedom is not the length of time between sin cycles. Freedom is when the cycle is broken. And what used to bind you doesn't bind you anymore. And I want to announce to you that the cross of Jesus is not a sin management program. It's a sin eradication program. So don't buy into any theology that makes you comfortable in carnality. It's heresy. God wants you to understand that He's called you to live free. So if you're not experiencing 
freedom, it's not on his part. You need to start to ask questions. Lord, why is this pattern going on? Many of you are not asking questions. And keep asking. You just want to quit. Lord, why is this pattern the way it is? What? See, when you start to ask questions, then you open up yourself for spiritual intelligence. And what you learn, you can also now be a blessing to others because you've been through it yourself. Okay, so Genesis 28. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba, went towards Haran. Verse 11, Genesis 28, 11 now. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed a dream and behold, the ladder was set up on earth and its top reached to heaven. And that, sorry, and there were angels of God there uh, ascending and descending on it. I'll just pause there because we don't have the time to break this down properly, but I also want you to understand some things going on behind the text. Now, this is something I teach on often, and because of what I'm sensing in the room, with the amount of, I guess, and by the way, I want you to hear me out. I'm not saying don't come to me for prayer. I'm not saying don't come to our team for prayer because we have a ministry team that will pray for you uh, and when we have times of ministry. I'm not saying don't do that, but what I'm trying to get is I want to, I want I want you to learn the principles that can help you get to freedom where you push into it yourself. Now, people can pray with you on the journey, but you understand how altars work. So here, Jacob is running away from his brother Esau because of the deception that took place when he got the blessing. And you all know the story, or most of you will know the story. You know, uh, it was time for Isaac to release the blessed. And uh, he told his, uh, uh, Esau to prepare him his favorite kind of stew. You know, oh, I'm, I'm just thinking of what I said in one of the sessions yesterday. If you notice something, when, when the stew was, uh, uh, I think, I've not got the text right here. But he wanted... Uh, Esau to prepare this to you so that his soul will bless him. I'm trying to get at something here. It, It was like he wanted his son to do something that would trigger. Are you with me? You remember what I said about Hannah yesterday? She released a vow from a deep emotion. So when Esau prepares this stew. The idea is, as Jacob, no, when Esau prepares stew, as Isaac has it, because it's his favorite, his soul is stirred, and in that place, he wants to invoke a blessing. Are, are you hearing me? <laughs> so you don't just play with emotions and those things that stir you on the inside. You know, you gotta be cautious because it can it can go both in the positive and the negative. So here, he was going to do that over Esau. And obviously, you know the story. Um, uh, Esau's mom, um, I forgot her name now. What was her name? Rebecca. Rebecca. That's my wife's name. I shouldn't forget that. (laughs) (laughs) Someone said, I'm tired. Pray for me. (laughs) Uh, So um, she uh, obviously got um, Jacob to kind of prepare, she helped him prepare this to you and, you know, and all, you know, and the blessing that was meant to go to Esau, you know, went over Jacob. And now Esau is mad. And in our context in 21st century, we may not understand the contention there because we're like, well, I used to think this way. Well, you know, if Isaac blessed Jacob, I'm sure he could just bless Esau. Well, the way the blessing works was not quite like that. It, it was like a deposit in the spirit. Once it's released, it's released. It can't be re-released. That's the way it seemed from the text. Otherwise, if it could be re-released, it could have just released the same thing over Esau. But it was like, it's done. And one of the ways I understand that, or help, one of the things that helps me understand the tension between the two brothers is, you know, inheritance. Imagine you are two brothers and you are in line to inherit like, you know, 10 million pounds. 
And, you know, maybe there's only one parent left living, you know, and then before that parent dies, one of the brothers goes to that parent because they know maybe they have dementia or whatever, and they get them to change the will. The will was meant to be split 50-50, but they get them to change the will to be like, the one gets 9 million and the other one gets 1 million. And then the father dies and everything comes out. How many realize that is World War Three? <laughs> in that family and many families right now are at war because of things just like that can anyone attest test that in the context of a will being switched around you can appreciate the frustration now with that same mind try to think about Esau and Jacob and the blessing Esau feels like Jacob had taken something that he shouldn't have but in a way he kind of also sold his birthright so <laughs> So, I mean, there are lots of undertones to this. But where I'm going is, Jacob is scared and Jacob is running away. What Jacob received was the blessing. Everyone say the blessing. blessing. Say it again. Blessing. The blessing did not start with Isaac. What was released to Jacob did not start with Isaac, the one who released it. It started with Abraham. Abraham received the blessing based on a covenant. Are you with me? Yeah. Abraham had a covenant with God and that covenant produced blessings. And now that blessing is traveling down the bloodline. Uh, uh, Jacob does not have to know much about Abraham. Are you with me? He does not have to know much about Abraham for him to be implicated by the life and the covenant that Abraham stepped into. He doesn't have to know, he doesn't have to know that covenant. The, the fact that he was born into that bloodline, are you hearing me? Means it's implicated by whatever covenants exist in that bloodline. So now, He's received a blessing, but what's responsible for the blessing is a covenant. And what is responsible for watching that covenant is a spirit being. Are you seeing the pattern? The blessing, the covenant, and the spirit being. The spirit being will always monitor the covenant. You remember the lady that was bent over? There was a lady in scripture that Jesus prayed for that was bent over. Was he 18 years? I forgot now. 18 years. 18, is that correct? She was bent over for 18 years. The spirit that was responsible for that did not think about taking a break. Oh, you know, I've been here for 18 years. I'm just going to get a cup of tea right now <laughs> and have, you know, just a quick break. The spirit responsible for that, for her being bent over, stay there for 18 years. That helps you understand how spirit beings function. Once they latch onto something because of a legal ground that has been set, they are going to stay. They're jealous for that space. And oftentimes they, they, they hate being challenged especially when they can find a legal ground as to why they are there. I'm talking about demonic spirits. So, Jacob received the blessing, and the blessing came because of Abraham's grandfather, who had a covenant with God. Now, that, the God of that covenant is watching the lineage. Are, are you with me? He's, he's watching Abraham's lineage. So, when Jacob got the blessing, he knows he's in trouble with Esau, so he starts to run for his life. Now, because what he took was heavy in the spirit, the decisions he was making to run and in what direction he was going to run in, those decisions were influenced by the spirit of what he carried. 
But he was not conscious that that spirit was influencing the direction he ran in. Are you hearing me? In his mind, he just wants to run for his life. But he doesn't know that a spirit being is now watching him because he's inherited something huge. So that spirit being somehow has influenced his decision making to the point now he decides to run in this direction and not that direction. The spirit being caused him to run in a direction that led him to the altar that his grandfather built. Are you, are you hearing me? He thought he was running away from Esau, but the spirit was drawing him to the altar. In his mind, he's running, but spiritually, he's been drawn. Many of you think you make decisions just with your natural mind. You don't understand that because of certain things that have gone on in your lineage, you find yourself attracted to certain types of people all the time. Uh-oh. Because whatever is going on in your bloodline, the spirit responsible for whatever covenants have been going on knows that your bloodline has to be attached to a certain type of bloodline. Are you with me? So sometimes, even in that bloodline, the men are often attracted to certain types of women because it's in the blood. And oftentimes, because it's negative, the covenant responsible for those attractions, it, it draws them to other bloodlines that puts them in more bondage and destruction. So you could be a Christian and your desires are not just natural. They're stirred from things in your lineage that you have no idea about. But because you've not spent time with God, you just see the guy at church with biceps and triceps. And like, oh Lord, he looks cute. You start flirting. And don't even ask God about him. Because these days, people don't really care what God thinks until they've made a decision to marry the person. They're like, okay, Lord, what do you have to say? You already made the decision. Even if the Lord says no, you will try to change that no to a yes in your heart. The time to find out what the Lord thinks is not when you're already emotionally invested. That's wrong strategy. In fact, by the way, prophets, when you're already emotionally invested, it's very difficult for you to now discern God. So when you're in a situation as a prophetic person and you know your emotions are so invested, now you need to seek outside help. Please help me discern. Because right now, I, I'm too invested emotionally in this. Oh, oh, I'm a man of God. Oh, I can always... When you're so... There are times you need people to help. Anyone hearing me today? So the enemy is studying the covenants that exist in your bloodline and he is watching and he's tracing them with his demonic spirits to camp and, you know, stay there and hold his ground. And so you come to church, you see the guy, you think they look good and you start dating. You have no idea that even your attraction, are you hearing me? was a pulling to your destruction. You thought it was, oh, he looks good, but the enemy had orchestrated destruction and activated what was in your bloodline. And so you think you're the one making the decisions. You have no idea it's coming from somewhere else. Just like Jacob did not know it was the Lord drawing him. So when he got to the altar that his grandfather built, then, isn't it interesting? The Spirit drew him, but the Spirit also timed him. Because he got to that altar at the right time. He got to the altar when he was tired. <laughs> Think about it. He could, have, he could have chosen to, he could have been going in that direction and then stopped halfway and just going, you know, I'm tired, I'm going to sleep. No. Every 
everything was programmed in the Spirit, all because of the covenant and the Spirit monitoring that covenant. It made sure it ended up where it ended up. And when Spirit beings are monitoring your life, especially on the negative side, it doesn't matter what country in the world you go to. Oh, you know, I was born in Zimbabwe and there's a lot of witchcraft there and now I'm going to move to Canada because they don't do witchcraft. <laughs> Lie. <laughs> go to Canada, marry a white person if you want. Go to, go to, I don't know, go to England, marry. If there is a spirit responsible for things in your bloodline, oh, you know, these white people, they don't really understand witchcraft. If I get with them, they will be, I'll be. But, <laughs> If I get with them, you know, I'll be okay. By the way, I can say this because I'm married to a white person, just so in case you're wondering. Some of these white people have a lot of spiritual intelligence. Don't look at the color of their skin and think they know nothing. I'm telling you. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I, I'm just going to travel to this country and, you know, I'm, I'm going to get my visa and I'm going to go and study and I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And you have all these desires and... And you think because you're out of the country, you're out of the covenant, and you're out of the monitoring spirit. It's a lie. So people, because they don't understand their spiritual lineage, your surname, your, your surname right now, who instigated that surname for your clan? The person who instigated that surname caught, had... Maybe this is more relevant for some of us Africans, right? The person who caught that surname, to be able to catch that surname must have come into some sort of understanding. I'll use my surname, for example, in a second. Must have come into some sort of understanding that made them choose that name. So... What made them choose that name? Some of us who have um, African backgrounds and there's a lot of idolatry in our history. Who gave your family that name? And what revelation did they have to give your family that name? And now, many generations later, you're carrying that name. Do you realize, you know, even though Abraham is gone, the children of Israel are called sons of Abraham. Not grand, 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 great, great, great grandsons. They're sons. It's almost like just one generation down. Even though it's many generations in reality. So you're a son of, like me, son of a Lateran. So who was the person in my clan that gave my family that name? Because I know my dad had to war on that name. Are you tracking with me? So we're now going to take a deep dive into Yoruba. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm going here because I didn't plan to say any of this. Honestly, I did not plan to say any of this. I will use my surname as an example. Now, I don't speak Yoruba fluently, but I understand Yoruba mostly. So, my surname is Aladiron. That's the way you pronounce it. Many Yoruba people would interpret that as dream come true, but that's not what it means because the word Allah, depending on the intonation, means different things. So, Allah means dream. Allah means purity. So the original name from how I remember my dad telling me was, it was Allah Orisha. Ding wrong. Now, now, all, all the Yoruba people went, wow. <laughs> because Orisha is like a God. It's like a, I don't even know how to, it's like one of these gods, these idols that people worship. Are, are you hearing me? So, the surname was caught by someone in my clan that had a priesthood. Are you hearing me? But the priesthood was to an idol. So, he named the whole generation the purity of that idol becomes a generation. Until a warrior arises in the clan. And says, no more. So the name has been changed. 
Because what you need to understand is, when there is a priesthood in your family, say your great 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 grandfather was a was a herbalist, was a witch doctor, there is something of God's calling on that bloodline that the enemy has hijacked. And God's calling still remains on that bloodline until a deliverer arises in that bloodline. And I'm telling you, you may just be the deliverer for your bloodline. Oh! Abalana Vandia Sanayas, Emaya Talandohas, Abayas, Ibayas, Ebayas. Oh! The devil messed with the wrong person. Oh! He messed with the wrong person. He should not have made you come to this meeting. He's a liar. I don't know what my great-grandfather did because I never met him. But I know he was a preacher of righteousness. And what I heard was when he preached, people came under conviction and would leave the meeting sorrowful. <laughs> By the way, that's what happens to me when I preach too. <laughs> I didn't know him, but somehow whatever was on the bloodline got on me. What I'm trying to say is, until someone arose, and I know, in fact, my dad is probably watching, I've not spoken deeply to him about this, and I did not plan to talk in this direction. I don't even know how I ended up here, honestly. But let's finish this. I know he had to war to change the name. So I still bear the name, but it's now been redeemed for what God intended. Now listen, so even though the name is Allah Diron, the full name is Allah Oluwa Diron. And all the Yoruba people now celebrate. Because it's been shifted and Oluwa means the Lord. So my surname now means the purity of the Lord becomes a generation. Now you understand why I teach on holiness. Now you understand why I'm all about consecration. Because it is in my DNA, it is my name. What the devil meant for evil, God has turned it around. And now I am a priest of the Most High. My children will be priests of the Most High. This bloodline is set apart to righteousness. The devil is a liar. Hiya. Jacob is now called a son of Abraham. And he is now implicated by the covenant that Abraham caught, even though he wasn't there. The fact that you weren't there when your great great father called that covenant does not mean you're not implicated by it. Because just like this covenant produced blessings, for many of us who have idolatry in our past, the covenants that have been cut in your bloodline is producing curses. And many of you, some of the white people will understand Freemasonry. As you rise in it, you go in deeper levels of initiation and covenants that implicate your bloodline. And I remember speaking to someone recently that came to me and said, you know, what do I do? My dad is, is, is a Freemason. By the way, you can play, Lloyd. And you know what I like. <laughs> find me in the spirit. In the words of Aroma Asai, find me in the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Where was I? Yes, I met this guy. I was saying, James, I don't know what's going on. My dad is a Freemason. And even though I'm praying, I've been to deliverance meetings where they've broken things off and they've done this and they've done that. But it he, he seems like he's still active in that. What do I do? Because it seems like the prayers are not working. 
I said, it's not that the prayers are not working. Your father is involved in deep occultic activities. Those covenants, his cotton, are connected to an altar. And we don't have time to go deep into altars right now. Altars are landing strips for spirit beings to express themselves into the earth. Altars are places where the natural and the spiritual collide. Like an airport. An altar is like an airport that makes it possible for a plane to land. An altar makes it possible for spirit beings to express themselves. So your father it has an altar. You are going to Christian meetings wanting the man of God to lay hands on you to break the curses. But the problem is your father's altar is stronger than your own. So the men of God can break the curses all they want. Because he's your father and he's still deep in Freemasonry, you now have to raise up your own altar. Ah! You have to raise up your own altar to overthrow his altar. This is not a magic fix. Your father took years to raise that altar. And it's connected to things that have been going on for maybe hundreds of years. You think you're just going to show up and say, I come against you in Jesus' name, it's over? Even if you did that, those things will still fight back because your altar, brother, is weak. When you start to build your altar, you choose the path of the path of priesthood the path of prayer and it's the lifestyle of consistent prayer it's not like you say okay Lord I'm going to pray at this conference and then you know when it's over I, I feel a, a bit of a relief from my of affliction I'm just going to rest and chill and I'm, I'm not going to pray as intense anymore the thing with this lifestyle is once you choose it you have to live it until you die It's not that when you choose it and you start to build it, you don't get to breakthrough. And once you get to breakthrough, you can't, I mean, you get to breakthrough, you can abandon it. And the altar is still strong, especially if it's an altar that go integrity in it. But your consistency at the altar strengthens the altar. Your inconsistency at the altar weakens the altar because the Freemason guy is consistent. Listen, he's more submitted to the devil than you are to God. And somehow you want to have authority? You're joking. Corinthians talks about spiritual warfare. He says, be ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. Your obedience is not complete you're still living a life of compromise. And one of the things is, when you begin to choose the path of the altar, holiness is the only way. Because you are caught in covenant with a Holy Spirit. So you cannot be fornicating. You cannot be in adultery. You cannot be in pornography. You can't be in unforgiveness because the spirit you're wanting to connect with and have intimacy with, he hates those things. Those in the demonic realm, they understand the spirit they're working for. So they know what the spirit doesn't like. And whatever instructions that spirit gives them, they obey it to the T. They're so particular. Anyone knows what I'm talking about here? But we in the kingdom of light, the spirit gives us instructions about lifestyle requirements. Oh, we say, oh, it's legalism. Oh, you know, it's okay if I just, you know, sin. I'm sure God's going to forgive me. He will, but you don't understand the implication of your sin in the spirit realm. You don't understand the repercussions and how that affects the integrity of your altar. You don't understand how many months, maybe years, that has set you back. You've been forgiven, but you've been set back. So the life of the priest is critical. In fact, the lifestyle of the priest validates the potency of the altar. 
You can't live anyhow. Holiness unto the Lord. When you start to invest in building your altar, initially it feels like nothing is happening. The symptoms still carry on. If it's headaches, they're still there. If it's, you know, uh, you don't have a job or you feel like every time you try to apply for a job, it falls apart, those things keep happening. So you think to yourself, because nothing is manifesting in the natural, your altar activity as a priest is ineffective. Lie. If you were here in the first session, I talked about comparing yourself. If you have two people I give two million pounds to, to build, and one is going to build on a land that's prepared, and the other is going to build on a land that's full of water and swampy. That two million pounds for the guy who's full of the swampy land is first going to go in securing the land. So a lot of the money will be gone before building starts. You're in a place where, because the other altar has been going on for so long, you wanting to raise up another altar in your worship, in your prayer, in your devotion that overrides that one, it's going to take time for you to... Are you with me? You're going to keep investing. You're going to keep investing. You're going to keep worshiping. You're going to keep praying. If you're discouraged, you come to a conference like this. You get refired. You go home. You're going to keep investing. You're going to keep investing. You get discouraged, you go somewhere else. See, it's, it, it's not wrong to get discouraged. It's just sad if you stay there. It's like I decided to drive from here to Glasgow and I run out petrol halfway. I'm not going to sit down there and just cry. Oh, I have no and just be discouraged. You know what you do? You go to the filling station and get petrol in the car. And do you know what? What you do? You carry on the journey. <laughs> oh, James, I've been praying for a year. I've been praying for two years. And now you're feeling discouraged? Well, it means you're running out petrol. You know what you need to do? Come to the petrol station like this and get some more petrol in your vehicle and carry on building that altar. Because what happens is as you invest in building that altar, the strength of that altar will start to rise. And it starts to rise. And sometimes you're oblivious to the strength you're accumulating in the Spirit. So it gets to a point where your altar rises and it starts to reach a point of equilibrium with the other altar because you're about to surpass it. I, are you hearing me? When you get to the point of equilibrium and you're about to surpass it, oftentimes it could be one of the strongest seasons of warfare. Because the enemy can detect your spiritual potency increasing and your power increasing. So he will try everything to shut you down. Oftentimes to get you offended. Are you hearing me? The prayer meeting that would probably shift the balance in the scale. The devil would make sure you don't go to that prayer meeting. You wake up, you have a five-year spouse, your children curse you out, you try to tell them off and you feel bad because you just smacked them and then you're trying to go here and go, oh, you know what, I can't even pray today, forget it. Uh, someone smashes into your car as you're on your way to prayer meeting. Oh my goodness, I've got now another a thousand pounds to pay for this car. Okay, what am I going to do now? Oh, I was meant to be at this meeting. I'm like, Are you with me? The supernatural uses the natural to cause frustration. Many of you are not looking at your life with the spiritual eyes. Just looking at it naturally. Oh yeah, this happened, this happened. You need to have ways to detect negative patterns. Let me read you just a few things to be aware of. What family cycles? What are the cycles consistent in your family? What are the things that happen to the firstborn sons in your family? Watch the patterns. What, what happens to them? How does wealth and finance function in your family? Is there any pattern? How are people's marriages in your family? Is there any, have, have you noticed patterns? Oh, how do people die in your family? When do they die? Have you noticed? 
Because like the woman who's bent over, the spirit responsible for those activities is not going to stop. And you keep seeing the pattern repeat itself because it's a sign that a spirit being is responsible. And that spirit being is watching a covenant that was cut at an altar. You weren't there when it was cut, but now you're facing the consequence. That's why you have to reverse it. And the way you reverse it in understanding, you have to give yourself to the life of priesthood. As you begin to notice these negative patterns, they point to deep things that may be existent in your family. So it's okay to come to a man of God for prayer. But listen to me, please. Don't just be running to men of God if you don't want to build your altar. Because there could be some relief and breakthrough. But the altar in that family is still there and yours is still weak. So you may have relief for yourself, but we don't know if your children would have any relief. So forget about yourself for a sec and think about the next generation. If you're going to think about the next generation, then you understand your altar has to surpass theirs. The Lord is inviting you to the way of the altar, the way of priesthood. There is no other way to shift these things until we commit to this lifestyle. I believe tonight the Lord wants to bring freedom. By teaching, He's bringing revelation to you. But also He wants to bring freedom. That's why we sang no more, no more shackles. No more chains. I am free. It was a prophetic song speaking to this moment we're entering right now. What I want to do is I want us to enter this moment with careful consideration. Not just doing this lightly. Many of you have come here for deliverance. Oh God, I've, been, I've heard a testimony and I, and I want to be free. And you want an instantaneous fix. And listen, I believe at this altar tonight, the Lord is going to bring some deliverance to people. I know that. But I'm wanting to point you to something deeper than just what happens here and now. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some of you, this is going to even cause you to do some research into your... Like, who gave us this name? What life did they live? What did they believe? And how can I overturn that by seeking God righteously? Do you understand with me? The Lord is going to raise up deliverers in bloodlines that will break the cycle. It may have been going on in your brother's life, in your sister's life. It may have been going on, you know, in your parents. And whatever the context is, I am saying to you, you are not at this conference by accident. The Lord is raising you up as a deliverer to break the cycle. He's calling you as a priest to arise. Valastina Maluhastras. Alundia Kapailis, Havanda Hasusta Senemes, Hamalana Manana Mahasas, Haye, 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 Yas, Hebela non dembalostudes, Ibeketalana Mando Vastus de Nimbus, Isalunstos, Avistras de Nantos, Aste las de Nanas. He belayas to volas, avayases, 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 he manto la pailas, he punto la mantos, a bela tala navestos, he melene mandas, he vacato lo no mandres, avayas, avayas, he pato le dembe catolas, ah, aya he. Abailas, 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 Abailas,
Ibandos, Sevecas, Epitros, Sinavus, Azantu, Lacainos, Ibaikas, Tunumbas, Ibulas, Tempinkos, Astranas. Ah! Ah, la nama, la nama, la nama. Deliverers arise. You're not at this meeting by accident. The enemy has been fighting you because you've stepped into a Kairos moment. It's a day of deliverance for you. It's a day of deliverance. Oh, Evaios, Evaios. Hamondis, Ibaikos, Staminos, Evaios. Of red. 